Good morning. My name is Dr. Peter Fennick, and I'm a consultant neuropsychiatrist in London. I've practiced all my life looking at mind and brain. Not only that, I have been very interested in meditation from the time of the Beatles. In fact, it's rather unusual because George Harrison uh, volunteered to be under my electrodes. And I was one of the first people to show exactly what meditation did to the brain waves. I've been looking around at large numbers of people for those who I think are particularly interesting. And I came across Alain Forger. He has a capacity, which I haven't seen in anybody else. He has a capacity to induce in me when he meditates the feelings that I'm seeing light around him. So Alan, thank you very much for coming today. It's a pleasure, Peter. It's because, always a pleasure to spend time with you. Because what I want to do is to just go through your history a bit. You, you have this capacity uh, to make other people see light. T tell me about your own journey towards acquiring this ability. Well, um, by the age of 21, um, I ask myself, what is consciousness? What is I? What is the meaning of life? And from that moment, I did invest two to three hours reading metaphysic, practicing silence, trying to find out what my dream were telling me. As I uh, did not have to work, I worked on myself. And uh, my story is very simple. I have an old Lebanese friend who told me one day, Alan, God has punished you. Took your mother away when you were 18 months, no brother, no sisters. Took your father away when you were nine and he gave you money. So those were my cards. And I played my cards studying myself. By the age of 26, I made my first breakthrough, 25 minutes, 39, three days. And then I started to develop the phenomena you mentioned. Right, let's just have a, a little look at that. You said that you didn't work. Were you a trust fund kid? Yeah, absolutely. And so you were enormously privileged to be able to spend a lot of your time uh, in cathedrals? Yes, I had uh, uh, the freedom of my time. So uh, uh, I used it to, to work on myself. And do you think that that capacity of yours to sit silently in cathedrals has anything to do uh, with the development of your ability to radiate light? I think it was a preparing stage. When you sit in silence, when you meditate, in other words, what do you do? You observe your thoughts and you are not identified to them. So by observing them, sometimes you can question them, they go deeper into your defense system. Because I believe the task of the body is to last. The task of the ego, the psychological structure, is not to let go. And we are made layers by layers. So to explore ourselves, to explore our maze, we got to go down into your, our defense system. And if you don't have a good observer, non-judgmental observer of yourself, it's impossible. So meditation is a clear training we need to step back not being identified by the law, the defense, the system will produce in order to stay in place. I'm sure that you know that meditation now is absolutely worldwide and that many healthcare systems recommend that meditation is extremely good for de-stressing. Uh, do you think that meditation the meditation you were doing was essentially different? No, absolutely not. You are drawn into your thinking process or not. Every technique of meditation is to freeze the mind. When you repeat a mantra, when you visualize something, it's all in order to block the mind. You block the mind, you block the thinking process. But let's look at that for a second. Uh, your intellect is made of thoughts. Thoughts come from memory. And memory, that's where the bugs are, the primary flow which maintains the entire system. So uh, the idea is to observe the thoughts and question them in order to go down 
to the primary layers which are at the origin of your repetitive behavior. When you were meditating, do you think you were doing anything different from, let's say, a Zen monk who spends years watching his well, I think it's basically the same thing. You observe your thinking process like fish jumping out of the water. It's a meditation is just stepping back. And that was two hours a day, was it? Roughly, sometimes one hour and a half, sometimes three hours. And I used to go to cathedral, Chartres, Notre Dame, uh, the Welling Wall in Jerusalem, um, the Temple of the Golden Tooth in Sri Lanka, if I was there. I was attracted by places connected to an archetype. It's like you connect yourself to a psychic grid, whatever the belief system is. Yes, I understand. That's quite a difficult concept, a psychic grid. What do you mean by that? Well, you have a Muslim archetype. If you turn toward Mecca, very clearly there is a very powerful archetype there of a million and million of people turning toward the same point for 1,200 years. It creates an archetype. You've got a Muslim archetype, a Christian archetype. When you connect with those archetypes, you feel the subtle energy. You feel this subtleness as a tactile energy. Uh, in London, you have the Chapel of St. Face in Westminster. Westminster Abbey. Yeah. Yes. You've been there. I have indeed, and it's uh, St. Faith's is a very powerful chapel. So did you seek out places like that? For yes, your absolutely, absolutely. For a few decades, that was really part of my practice. So for many years then, you meditated daily, and the rest of the time, because two hours doesn't fill the trust fund kids' life. Well, the rest of the time, uh, I was reading metaphysic, at least an hour, and otherwise I was carried by the flow of my life, um, trying to keep my money, because uh, when you're not educated to make it, usually predator comes to you. So it has been a fight. Yes. All right. Now, you used the word, you talk about a breakthrough. What do you mean by that? Breakthrough is when the ego collapses. So the breakthrough will be awakening the kingdom of heaven, it will be the state of consciousness where you are reborn to what you were always. When you make a breakthrough, you find the part of you which is never born. And it's only if you find the part of you which is never born that you cannot die. Uh, that's why I, I named my book How to Get Out of This World Alive. And do you think many people make breakthroughs? Are you exceptional in any way? I think this has been made for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. When you read the, the metaphor of the cave from Plato, it's about a breakthrough, getting out of the illusion. When you read the different mystics, Christian, Sufi, Taoist, it's always the same story. I think uh, a few, I see the mystics as the scouts of our evolution. When you make the breakthrough, uh, very clearly, you modify something in your body. Well, you have studied my brain, and those uh, phenomena which I seem to generate, or better phrase, my absence generates, are known in mystical literature. Yes, uh, let's say that they correlate with these phenomena. So I think that's the best way of doing it, because we don't know what is causative and what isn't. So, the breakthrough is something which has occurred for many people. Now, you described yourself at the beginning as a student of consciousness. You wanted to know who you were. Has the breakthrough helped you in any way? But the breakthrough showed me that my real nature has nothing to do with time, has nothing to do with space. It's just to be. And you mentioned the word evolution, suggesting that this is a track. Um, are you uh, on a track? And can everybody get on the track, or it's only for a privileged few? No, of course, I think we are all made to, at the end of the day, uh, go there. But for that, uh, numbers of quality, to my understanding, are required. Uh, the first one will be a good level of awareness which means no drug, no alcohol, not too many addiction, or keep them at a low level. Then to have a good discipline, and if you don't have the discipline, you don't have the will. If you don't have the will, uh, nothing much will happen. And uh, awareness and discipline will serve 
intellectual honesty. But if you're not intellectually honest, uh, you won't see the rules, the decoys, the old system will fire in order to stay in place. And courage, because uh, our structure is driven by fear. And uh, mechanically, when you'll be having the breakthrough, you'll get into a psychotic phase. It, it happened to me, as you know, but it happened to many mystics. When the Buddha sees Maha on an army of demons, it's the ultimate law where the ego structure press on fear. When Jesus sees Satan, it's the same story. And you have many, many mystics who have devilish or divine vision, which are just the ultimate law uh, to maintain them at the level of duality subject, object, me, and what is not me. So in fact, working on yourself is working with a system of defense. It's a little bit like First World War. You have to take one trench, two trench, three trench, and to break the front. And the first trench, of course, are made of parental issues. Uh, usually, if you're a boy, it's mainly the mother. Usually, if you're a girl, it's mainly the father. As you know, and you saw that with many, many patients, I suppose. You were talking about laws. What is a law? Well, when you are hunting, you have false duck to attract the duck. This is a law. Uh, your ego will use numerous exit behavior in order not to have consciousness drilling at the very point where it puts it at risk. You'll evade. You'll evade in some addiction alcohol, sex, workaholic. All that will be repetitive law, and unfortunately, we get addicted to those law. And uh, most of people uh, spend their life stuck there, being on repeat. So, if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that we have patterns of behavior which we tend to repeat. We are addicted to them. And they therefore control our life. Absolutely. And that meditation is one way of reducing that. But you have to have the qualities, as you say, of intellectual honesty to be able to look at these and recognize them rather than uh, hide yourself away from them. Yes, because we are made of layers. So most of the time we are caught at the surface of ourselves. But the repressed layers run the show. Uh, we have a level of repressed fear where we'll evade fear in food and alcohol. It's right. Example. Uh, let's just clear one thing up quickly. Do you think that yours is just another method of psychoanalysis? I mean, are you it's following the footsteps? Partly, it's partly that. You're exploring yourself. You're dealing with a psychological structure. So it's partly that, of course. Drilling into the layers, exploring yourself at this level, of course, you work with the psyche. So uh, uh, when you question yourself to find out the layer below, of course, it's partly in that sense. Yes, uh, but your your method is different. How does it differ? Well, uh, I use dream a lot. Uh, as you know, I have developed a dream archetype. And the idea is your higher self tells you every night through your own symbolical language, where you are, what's wrong, what you could be working on. And when you discover your symbolism, when you crack your symbolism, it gives you a little shock. And with a bit of training, you really see in which angle you have to push, in which angle you have to, which angle you have to deal with, because it's the same story, repeated, 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 the mother, the child trauma, and so on and so on. But the dream gives you some freshness to the question. And if it's not fresh, it doesn't work. You were talking about another concept called, which you called the higher self. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, there is a part of you which wants you to evolve. There is a part of you which wants you to be free. Uh, I see life as a game of hide and seek, unity, reality, God, whatever concept you want to use is not a concept, uh, doesn't change. So we could see this manifestation, life, as a game of hide and seek. And the Hindu, which is probably the oldest metaphysical civilization, has developed a concept called the Lila. 
And the Lila is a game of hide and seek. One, unity cannot know itself. To know yourself, you need a knower to an object which is known. You need the two, you need a subject and an object. So this unity loses itself in manifestation. One becomes two, four, eight, sixteen, mineral, vegetal, animal, human intelligence, ability to develop abstraction. And in that abstraction, if the ego structure can see it is not, reality finds itself again, a new, empty of you. In fact, all that would be a divine game of hide and seek. I think it's an interesting concept. It's a very difficult concept, and it's, it's a wide concept. So let's just look at what you're saying. As I understand you to be saying, is that there's a part of yourself, and you were linking that up with the wider aspects of consciousness, as I understand it. You use the word God. Are you religious? No, no. I am, a, how could I put it, a secular mystic, maybe. Uh, but once again, a mystics are the scouts of our evolution. That's the way I see things anyway. And uh, uh, the gate to reality or the gate to God, if you want to use that concept, and for me, God is what doesn't change. So everything changes. The gate is void. And what will allow void to kick in is a combination of psychological introspection using psychological method method plus the dream archetype I mentioned and metaphysical questioning because it has to be fresh. If it's not fresh, it does not function. It has to be new. You mentioned void. What does that mean? Nothingness. So in our evolution, we have to go through nothingness. Is that correct? Nothingness will be the gate to get us, to get our absence to the next level. And because our body-mind will have been emptied of the mind, we recognize ourselves as what we were always. Only at that level, fear truly dies. Now, there is the beginnings of a science of consciousness. This science of consciousness sees that people go through a change of state, which um, is equated by some workers in the field as enlightenment. And this then characterizes itself by a change in the way that these people see the world. They become a unity, very much like the state that you're describing. Do you think that these states, which we're now beginning to find, are not very unusual? Do you think that they are anything like your state when you went through the void? I think it's exactly the same thing. It's the true nature of everybody. Everybody, the first thing you realize when you crack your ego structure is that you have always been there, you will always be there, you can only be there. But then, of course, the ego will reconstruct itself. Those moments cannot last because when you are there, desire is gone, it's finished. You want absolutely nothing. You will act accordingly to what the situation will bring you, but you will not be in a defending mood. And if you are uh, uh, not in a defending mood, uh, you won't survive very long. Jesus, Socrates, Marguerite Parrot, Alaj, many mystics mechanically got killed because they lost their defense system. Yes, that's, that's quite a wide and broad concept. But do you, do you think that's applicable to people who go through a breakthrough of some type, that they then become vulnerable? No, because the ego will, will reconstruct itself, but not at the same level. If the ego reconstructs itself and you keep on the practice of meditation, stepping back, being in silence, it's at those moments you develop a body of energy, a body of light. And that's why you have uh, studies that those phenomena, how could I put it, my absence generates, <laughs> it's, that would be a way to phrase it. Uh, yes. uh, the people you interviewed, uh, it's about light, it's about smell, it's about, well, it's interesting, uh, we get into that, if you like. Uh, I think it's very important now to start talking about how you develop this ability to make other people see light. What is it? I did nothing. I, all of a sudden I realized, I was in 94, that uh, if I had someone in front of me and stepped back, that person was seeing light 
um, had the numbers of phenomena. I don't understand. Step back. Step, ba step back. Mean? Step back means is within myself. Uh, 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 I go back. Um, it's like dropping within myself. It takes a moment. So, um, you find that by stepping back, other people could see light? No, I step back within myself. I have this flavor of unity, and then people have a range of phenomena which appears to them. And what phenomena have you noticed that the subjects have when you step back? Uh, it would be more interesting you mentioned it. You have been, you have been in a group. What did you notice? Well, I noticed a number of things. People see colors, they see white lights, they smell smells, they hear sounds. Uh, so there's a very wide range of sensory phenomena. Do you do anything to evoke these phenomena? No, absolutely not. It's just stepping back and what happened happens. I, I am hardly there when it happens, hardly. If I was to say to you that your groups are intense, and I know that because I've been in some of your groups. If I was to say that they're intense, and this is all just pure imagination, um, it's people who overcommitted to you, and that these aren't real phenomena at all, what would you say? Well, uh, I would say you have put me in a lab with the numbers of guinea pig in order to demonstrate the opposite. So what do you think? Yes. Uh, what I think is that that is the first explanation that should be looked at. And certainly when I was considering writing this book, I could see that unless we did some scientific studies of you, then everybody will say, well, it's just quite simple. Imagination. 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 Absolutely. Well, I believe that through all those years of practicing silence in Gassipo at all, the training of meditation, and I really believe that the training of meditation has one aim, is to master imagination. If you don't master imagination, nothing can really happen because you will fool yourself. Uh, then let me ask you a question. How is one of your group members who says that they feel or see light, how would we know that's not imagination? By um, putting them on the receiving end behind the curtains and they don't know when I give energy or not. So now you're referring to one of the experiments which we did, mm -hmm. where we had you giving light and people behind curtains, mm -hmm. so they couldn't see you at all. Mm -hmm. And the question was, could they in fact uh, see the light? Or would it go? Or if they did see it, would they not see it when you were giving it? In Absolutely. other words, it was imagination. Absolutely. And the answer to that was, no, it seems as if uh, it's in fact driven by you and it's not imagination. So I think from my own viewpoint, and that's the science that we've done, the, uh, the group is not just imagination. There is in fact a real effect here. So let's actually go on to the light now. And here we come a little bit more into the scientific territory. Let's assume that you uh, do give light in a meditative state. So the first question is, is the state you're in when you give light different from everybody's normal everyday state? You say it is. I suppose it is. For me, uh, uh, is just, uh, I realize light was manifesting through my relative absence in 1994 for the first time. And since then, I've been doing it thousands and thousands and thousands of times. So it became part of the daily life. So it's like a slack, slight step back within myself and those phenomena appear. But I do nothing. I really do nothing. It's just the phenomena appear because I suppose I am less there. So uh, what is interesting about what you have validated by as a different lab where you did, did play with me as a guinea pig, uh, 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 this relative absence of myself uh, seems to be uh, raising the gamma, uh, lighting up <laughs> my brain. Uh, yes, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. 
In, in fact, you're right, because uh, the, when you measure the electrical activity of the brain, it's always divided up into bands, and these are commonly known uh, the delta or slowest band, theta a bit faster, the alpha uh, the band that uh, is normally there in the resting brain, then the beta band, and then the highest rate of all is the gamma band. What we found is that your gamma activity is extremely high when you're giving this light. So quite clearly, your, your physiological state is not just an ordinary state. You do something to make your brain change and work differently. Now, we might ask the next question, and that is, is there a history of meditation being related to light in any way? And the answer to that is that there are now in the literature a large number of papers which show that people, when they meditate, particularly on retreats, and one or two of the papers are looking at people in Buddhist retreats, they in fact experience light. They experience light within themselves, they experience light within the room. And so actual meditation does seem to evoke light within the person who's meditating. But what you do is quite different because the subject doesn't have to be meditating, he has to be attending to you, but not meditating. And it's in that state when, when you, your brain activity is showing a lot of gamma activity that they perceive light in themselves. So this is different. And so one of the questions was, is your brain linked up in some way to your students? Uh, if we look at the electrical activity of your brain and the electrical activity of the students, uh, do they show a relationship? In other words, a correlation. But the correlation wouldn't be terribly interesting because it doesn't tell us about causation. And causation is what you can measure with various statistics. And it looks as if the student can cause activity, and I use the word cause, activity in your brain, and you can cause activity in the student's brain. So there is a very strong linkage there. Now, what we don't know is how common this linkage normally is, but it does seem that this linkage arises. And so we now go back to the question, uh, are your students imagining it? It would seem not. It seems that they have physiological changes too, which are driven by you. So this then leads us on to the next question. Are the special situations that they're in that they can see uh, the light more easily? Now, what do you think of that? Do you think that students can see the light more easily in some situations and not in others? What I've learned uh, doing that with a few thousand people, it really varies. Uh, the native to the energy see it one time out of two, roughly. Uh, some people are, uh, uh, who come regularly will all of a sudden uh, uh, be struck by me disappearing entirely uh, in the energy. Sometimes it will just be feeling, it can be smell, it's very different. But I, I, I control nothing at this level. I, I, all I do is step back. So my understanding, it's like a, a, a Russian doll. It's like field of resonance. It's like consciousness, energy, which can manifest uh, into light, uh, uh, just resonates uh, through the relative absence I can trigger. That's my understanding today. Yes. And in the, your students who have questioned, uh, it's clear that when they are sitting in front of you and feel the energy or the light, and we're using two words now, Light is one set of phenomena, and energy seems to be another. Well, light is energy. I think energy uh, uh, embodies light, embodies a feeling, embodies a smell. Uh, that's why I use energy. And the energy that they feel enters the body and tracks up the body and tracks around the body. How do you explain that? Just through resonance. Just for reasons, I have no other explanation by that, but that. But very clearly, it appears, as you have experience, uh, to clear the psychological blockage. So, the giving of light has a function. Now, tell me more about the function 
of, of the giving of life? What does it actually do to your students? My view of this is uh, 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 I am here to accelerate the evolution of some people, and this light seems to be dissolving the psychological blockage, which in return accelerates the evolution of the student. Okay, so what we've seen is that when you give light, then your students see it, and uh, I've done a number of experiments with you. I'll put people in darkened room. Uh, do they see it better or not? And here you come across anomalies. No, it's not seen better in a darkened room. In fact, it's not seen so well, but it's still seen. In a brightly lit room, does that wipe out all the effects? No, it seems to enhance them. So light in the room seems to enhance the manifestation of light. The feelings of energy certainly uh, are present in a darkened room, but again, not to the same extent. So th this is an area w which needs to be looked at more closely by science. We also, um, I was also interested in whether your brain waves change immediately when people feel these effects, or whether in fact you have to get yourself into a particular state soon. And the answer to that is that your brain activity changes very quickly when you go into that state, and the students tend to feel it at the same time as it's rising in you. Therefore, again, okay, it, it's an end of it independent confirmation that what you do does affect your students. So now let's leave the light and its magic for speeding evolution. And let's ask you a little bit about your theory of how the mind is constructed. And uh, if you could tell me how you came across this idea so how is the mind constructed, in your view? Through identification. The key concept is identification. We identify. We are constructed by layers and layers and layers of identification. I am a man. I am a woman. I am English. I am American. I am Chinese. I am black. I am white. I am a socialist. I'm a capitalist, I am this, I am that. And those identifications run the show and create the repetitive pattern of behavior. But the first identification we are constructed is when we got out of the womb and the, uh, uh, the structure of our, of our parents, we take on board. So uh, to explore the mind, we have to explore the layers of identification we are made of. and. Uh, when through the right metaphysical question, we pull the last layer, the last rag, everything collapses. Uh, uh, what is I? What is the dynamic subject object? What is inside? What is outside? Is the observer the observed? Is the perceiver the perceived? Those are the questions which at the right moment will make the mind collapse. They're very metaphysical questions, aren't they? Yes, yes. absolutely. absolutely. That's why reading the mystic and the philosopher is an excellent training. <laughs> now, tell me, your method is called the four Ds. Absolutely. What are the four Ds? The first D is distancing. If you don't step back from your thoughts and feeling, you have no chance of questioning them, therefore understanding them. Distancing is step back. Discernment is to drill into the layer. I have a level of anger, why? I have a level of fear, why? What is a layer running the show down mm -hmm. below? Let's say uh, uh, I have a fear of rejection. Uh, I'm afraid to do something. Well, the, the basic problem, the cause, is I don't value myself. Because if I had value, I would not be afraid to face this man or this woman. So discernment is to drill within the layer. As a result of distancing, and discerning, you disidentify. You let go. You start to let go. Disidentification is to let go. And discrimination, the last thing, is a metaphysical questioning. You discriminate between what you are and what you are not, between the perceiver and the perceived. So in fact, it's a combination of distancing, discernment, drilling, and discrimination, questioning, which will crack the ego structure which at the right moment will make it collapse. 
Now, can people do this without your light? Of or course, of course. So what's so, the value of the light then? Well, I think it accelerates the process in dissolving the psychological blockage. Okay, that's what you have experimented uh, with my different students. Is that the case? Uh, yes, it does seem like that, I agree. And how many people who've been working with you have uh, made the breakthrough? Well, uh, we saw one who was very close, once, if you remember, in a group, who got on the edge. Uh, a few were on the edge, a few were very close on the edge. And remember yourself when you felt you were disappearing in the energy and felt the void and were blocked by fear. Yes, and that's absolutely right. I came to a point where I was totally surrounded by energy. And if I went any further, then I would cease to exist. So uh, what, what did block you? Yeah. So in fact, uh, 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 working on yourself is a sport where you challenge your fear. And that's why the Buddha saw Mahan army of demon, uh, his ego pressed on the fear button. That was the last law. In fact, working on yourself is to deal with the fear. So now we've looked at uh, fear. We've looked at the construction of the person. We've looked at philosophy, and um, I come to the final question, or set of questions. What are you going to do with this capacity of yours? What is your hope? One person takes a lot of time. So uh, I can only dedicate myself to a small number of people. And the idea is to make a few move, to make a few move. And if you make a few move, do you think this will change the evolution of the planet, or will it just help them? Well, I will have done my bit. <laughs> uh, Monsieur Fauché, thank you so much for coming. It was a pleasure, Peter. It was, it was, a, it was a, always a pleasure to talk to you.